good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the webinar is how to cope with botulinum toxin and uh, having injections available and the isolation. Dr. Marion will be presenting that and we are incredibly grateful for time. And thank you all for joining us. It's, it's a big ask to get this all working in 35, 36 people on a webinar all at once. Uh, and how amazing is it that we can all stay connected like this and we can still, in, in a world that's gone slightly, slightly left of centre at the moment, we can all still be together. Um, you will have all heard of Reach Out, Reach All, and when we first, uh, when we first thought up that idea, it was with the aim to have people be less socially isolated and that was before the pandemic so this is just an example of how reach out ritual will be working in the future this is one facet of it many of you will already be familiar with dr marion both from her previous work with Dystonia uk and and her her many many works outside of that um but a quick recap for you Dr. Marion studied at the University of Paris and pioneered the use of botulinum toxin in France in 1986. Uh, she has specialised in movement disorders, including dystonia, and she is the chair and founder of the British Neurotoxin Movement, uh, British Neurotoxin Network. I knew I'd get that wrong, and has long been one of Dystonia UK's medical advisors. We are so grateful and thankful, Dr. Marion, for you um, not only giving up your time today, but also for producing this amazing presentation. Uh, today, Dr. Marion will be talking, as I said, about dystonia during the pandemic, um, how to cope with no doctrine injections available and with the isolation. So without further ado, I couldn't be more excited to stop talking and introduce Dr. Marion. We're gonna pop your videos off so that it's not distracting during the presentation um, and we'll pop them back on at the end and I have a message that's making me laugh that says mute yourself now so I shall do that. Dr. Marion, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Dana for these uh, very kind words and uh, yes I'm, de I'm delighted to be here. The circumstances are not very nice but uh, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm very happy to, to, to share some uh, positive uh, message with, uh, with the patient and with a member of the Dystonia Society. And I think it's very important that the Dystonia Society put all this effort to do, to do this work. So I'm going to uh, show my presentation now and um, just, uh, sorry. So what I want to, to, to talk about, it's uh, the Dystonia in time, of, in time of pandemic. And as uh, Dana say, it's uh, what's happening at, in this time is that uh, uh, the botulinum toxin injection, which is so much expected, is going, may be missed because uh, the botulinum toxin services are not available in a, a large part of UK. And, uh, uh, and the patient also, you are going to be very, very uh, concerned because you are unable to plan your next injection. And uh, so what to do? And uh, we, we are going to see that the botulinum toxin, uh, uh, you could see it as the only treatment for dystonia, and also you will have the fear of going back at the initial state before treatment. So what I think we can do, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's try to explain what's going on. So I would like to reassure you in the middle of this storm, and I took this, uh, uh, um, logo from the uh, uh, this poster from the welcome collection which is uh, in bad weather stop look and listen and um, i would use that and say stop don't panic and and look look at your dystonia and we are going to look together and i'm going to tell you uh, what, what can happen if you miss the injection that's uh, the, the main important thing that you understand what can happen to you and, and listen what, what, what your tools, what, what can you do for yourself to go through the bad patch? So, uh, no panic. Why no panic? The dystonia has been uh, uh, treated, uh, diagnosed and treated much before the butyrum toxin was recognized as a treatment of dystonia. 
uh, uh, it's Choi in Vancouver who published the first uh, for cervical dystonia, the use of uh, butyl toxin. Uh, the first uh, report of uh, full treatment of the cervical dystonia was in a meeting in Paris of the Société de Neurology in 1929, and um, a lot, a lot of things was already there. And um, it was uh, Barre who talked about it's urgent to treat uh, cervical dystonia in the first two, few weeks of uh, after onset. They proposed the scopolamine, which is uh, uh, the anticholinergic, which was available at that time. They talk also about the treatment of the patient nervosity, and at that time it, they mean behind that uh, the anxiety of the patient. They talk about surgery, which was peripheral denervation. And uh, Mej, uh, the colleague of Barret, talk about the uh, psychomotor retraining in front of the mirror. But, and what's very important is that what he, Mej concludes, it's a, I've always seen the convulsive spasm after successive of better and worse, progressing toward appeasement. And that's very important. It, uh, the pronostic uh, with time is good, it's not going to get worse, but better. So that's very important thing. So what, what, what we did uh, more recently, in the, like the 1970s, and uh, Professor Rondeau in Paris published a, a, a report as well, who was uh, um, presented and, uh, in 1981, how he was treating cervical dystonia. And he mentioned again, the anticholinergic, at that time, it was uh, uh, in Paris, they were doing alcohol and phenol injection. So, um, of course, not the butyl toxin. The, he, psychotherapy was uh, proposed, sensory feedback, physiotherapy and relaxation. And uh, Mr. Jean-Pierre Bleton was uh, starting to work with, uh, Jean, with uh, Professor Rondo. And of course, there was surgical procedure, which was uh, uh, possible. And in the, in the 80s, when I was in uh, London with uh, in, uh, David uh, Marsden department, uh, had the cervical dystonia clinic, a very specialized clinic before the proton toxin uh, era. And, uh, and what we were doing is mainly anticholinergic. And we always send patients at that time to selective peripheral denervation. So uh, the, the, the patients where we were following them, we were treating them, and and, and, and it, it was hard. It was, of course, much harder than the, uh, before the Britain toxin, which really changed the prognosis. But what, what we saw is what the history, the natural history of, of, of dystonia, what's important is say, where are you in this, uh, uh, in your, in your uh, dystonia yourself? And uh, if we look at the natural history of cervical dystonia, because we don't have data about the other four columns of dystonia, it is uh, uh, well described this irritation, this weird sensation in the neck, this uh, isolated uh, jerk for a few weeks before the onset. And then the onset, as they say at that time, that's a report from 1929, at the favor of an emotion, long walk, being under pressure, we will call it stress now. The, 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 the jerks become more prominent and the spans become more severe. And that's the acute phase uh, that we can see at onset. And then there is a, 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 a spontaneous fluctuation without uh, uh, patient don't know why, and uh, uh, this uh, fluctuation can be very uh, disconcerting. And uh, uh, at the end, the convulsive episode become milder and less frequent, and they disappear to leave a residual neck stiffness. And Mears in The Lancet in 1971 published the same paper. We say that first five years, you have some aggravation and you have the acute phase, but then following that, you can have a, a, on the long term, a pacific coexistence of the dystonia uh, for the patients. So it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, usually your uh, condition will get in a plateau uh, with, over the years. But what, so what the uh, Botox injection uh, uh, do, and uh, it's one of my patients with blepharospasm uh, who told me, when you inject me, what I expect and what I like, it's a sweet spot. It is uh, eight, nine years, nine weeks time where I can completely forget about my dystonia, where I can ski, where I can drive, can work. And uh, 
But then he said after the sweet spot, uh, uh, the effect uh, uh, decreased, and but don't go to back square one. They don't go as bad. They just decrease. And uh, and that where we are, if you miss the injection, what happened at week twelve? And uh, we can imagine that uh, what happened when we inject the patient is that we improve the patient dramatically with the injection, and then the injection carry on having fluctuation with uh, stress, with the hormonal things like pregnancy. So the, 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 the dystonia will carry on fluctuating, but then they will go as well in a, in a plateau. And we all know now that uh, the first injection, it's a, a trial and error, and the patient sometimes will be well only for eight weeks, and the second injection, we can increase the interval, and the patient don't go back uh, 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 square one, the patient get better and better on the long term, and that's very important. And and we said, I said to the patient after that, after two, uh, three, four injections, you are becoming like a Swiss clock. You just need, you know, when the injection time is at the 12, 13, or 14, depending on the patient and depending on all these parameters, and 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 uh, the patient come back for his next injection. But it, it's maybe more complicated than that. Because the, the patient is waiting for his injection after 12 weeks because he thinks it's, uh, the sweet spot disappears and I need my injection. But uh, we can also see that when you repeat injection, uh, repeat a, a, repeated, a repetitive treatment is like a conditioning repetitive stimulus. And especially because the injection uh, are followed by a dramatic relief of the symptom. So the so, so the body will learn unconsciously that the injection uh, equal relief and there is a, a conditioning process which is happening. And uh, it's, it's, it's may influence the expectation uh, uh, on the injection uh, benefit. And that's, uh, uh, there's a term now which is pharmacological memory to see that for instance, if you inject uh, uh, the patient with just uh, water, there will be no body response. But if you inject uh, the patient with uh, uh, a drug or the toxin in your syringe, there will be a body response. But if you inject the patient who has a memory of the good response here, and you inject him again with water, he may have a response in his body, and it's a, uh, but it's an unconscious one. I'm not saying that we are going to inject a patient with water instead of glutamine toxin, of course not, but the the, the need, uh, uh, the regular need of the injection is uh, maybe also uh, somehow conditioned uh, unconsciously. So what, what, what's going to happen uh, to, to, to you after three months? It, it, it's, uh, you have to explore your own dystonia. Where are you in your uh, story? Are you in the plateau? Are you a patient who has been injected for many, many years and uh, uh, you don't know what's going to, to, you have to experiment, and that's uh, the, the, the opportunity. I know it's not, uh, we don't wish that, but uh, um, there is an anecdotal series. We had this last summer with my colleague of these seven patients where we were away, and patients who should have expected to be injected at uh, three months uh, were seen at four, five, six months after injection. And, um, and the patients were surprised, and we were surprised as well, that they said, yeah, we deteriorate the fact we were off at three months, but then at four months, we were the same that three months, at five months, we were the same that three months. And it's interesting that all these patients had, were five years on average of the disease, and they were injected for 3.5 years. So they were not, I'm not saying that they were at the beginning of the session in an acute phase where the, the need of uh, uh, glutamine injection is more acute but uh, they were in a more chronic uh, phase. So what to do without the toxin? Eh bien, uh, Henri Mej in, a, in a, um, say, idleness is as pernicious to the sick than an hectic existence. So please, uh, that's a French cartoon, but uh, if you're in isolation, don't decline, don't, uh, 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 start to do nothing because that's not good for your dystonia and not for anybody of us. So what, 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 what's happening? It's important to see the, the treatment of uh, focal dystonia like an holistic, integrated approach. 
and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, scientific paper who have published that in fact the disability of a patient is functional uh, is way of functioning every day and having pain is not always explained by the severity of the motor symptom and uh, for instance the mental is very important in dystonia and Mej again uh, talk about the mental despair the désarroi mental of the patient and, and, and we can understand why but uh, it's very important. And also he talk about the reciprocal interaction between moral and physique. And this interaction, he says, are acute, they are disconcerting, and they are imperative. And it's for sure that the, they are very disconcerting for the patient. Why I'm not well today? What happened? How the stress can just make my head turning more, or my eyes closing more, how it works? And uh, Mej calls the patient with cervical dystonia the torticolic. And the torticolic think only about their condition and more and more. And certainly now it's also shown that patients have a, a, a tendency of uh, obsessive rumination and uh, of their symptoms. And that's also a vicious circle, which is very, very uh, toxic for the patient. And he, he also talks about self-management. and. Uh, uh, there's a, a famous sentence in France which say, I don't say the patient is cured, but the patient has cured himself. So it's not the doctor who is curing the patient, but it's the patient who is curing himself. So, and uh, the recent data show that there's four times more depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorders in patients with uh, cervical dystonia and blepharospasm. spasm. And uh, social phobia, also negative body image, are very frequent in patients with cervical dystonia. So, uh, what to do for uh, to fight against uh, this uh, anxious uh, uh, rumination? I mean, I'm not expecting that you do this uh, <laughs> fancy uh, yoga posture with your uh, little pet, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that there is a lot of things to do. First of all, it's important to get a daily routine. And Mej was saying that you, a regular life is very helpful for patients with dystonia. Positive thinking, that's a more modern term, but it's important. If you don't have uh, uh, your botulinum toxin injection available, think about Botox holidays, think about detox. Make it a nice word. And most of all, distract your mind with physical activity. It's very, very important because we say that uh, the, 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 the dystonia is invading your mind and you think about it all the time. So it's very, very important to, 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 to distract your mind and carry on moving. Download mindfulness app, try mental imagery. It's very difficult when you're on your own, but you can find some good link on the internet or you can ask a, a hypnotherapist, for instance. They are quite good at mental imagery. And it's things that musician, athlete, we use very, a lot. Stop reading on the internet about the epidemic, the, the virus. And I think it's true for, for me as well, <laughs> and for all of us. And, uh, and stop reading about dystonia. And stay in touch with, with friends. So the psychomotor retraining uh, of MEJ, what, uh, you, you can do it if you've got cervical dystonia. And we see for the focal dystonia. It's on, the, on my blog on info dystonia. And emphasize that you have to sit without leaning on the back and put your hand on the table and have a mirror in front of you where you draw a line through the eyes, a line through the shoulders and a vertical line and concentrate at the cross of the line. And what he emphasized, it's a, a different movement like immobilization for five seconds and it's increased in, a, you can increase the, the, for five seconds every day to get better and better because all this, he called it psychomotor retraining and it's quite important as uh, we see now that uh, dystonia is an abnormal learning. So if you want to get better, you have to relearn things, relearn the movement which are uh, uh, changed by the dystonia. And then when you can do this immobilization, you can start doing just this slow and smooth movement without sacred of the head. But what's important is that you don't push, you don't force. It's like a, a child, if you push him, he will, ne will never learn. You have to, to your, 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 your brain will learn if it goes smoothly and uh, in a positive atmosphere. 
and uh, of course you do relaxation exercise which are very important and you can try in front of the mirror to relax your muscle of your neck and you can feel them with your hands and palpate to feel for instance your sternocleidomastoid to, 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 to relax and, uh, uh, and, and you apply exercise in, the, in front of the mirror when you ride, you read, you breathe, even when you, you can stand up in front of the mirror. For the eyes, it's, uh, uh, it has been more difficult to find uh, uh, behavior therapy for the eyes, but I found this one where, again, you go, you start to repeat normal movement, and you do mental imagery, you, you blink, you hold your high lid, high lid, lid, open, lid, open, in that case, it's not an exercise of your eyeball, of course not. It's you have to move your eyelid to recover the normal movement of your eyelid. And again, uh, in this uh, description uh, of Sharp in 1974, at any time, don't force the eyelid to open. And it's the same with the neck, it's the same with every dystonia. Don't uh, force uh, against the dystonic spasm. Wait and breathe and uh, try to relax. So it's uh, um, the modern way we will say, be kind with yourself, don't overdo it. But it's really, uh, it, 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 it's that the word now of marriage, gentle and methodical exercise. And uh, it's very important to exercise, to the exercise of muscle relaxation. Don't force the head to turn or your eyes to open. Let it go. And in case of a back patch, Mage also clearly said, decrease the number and duration of session of exercise. Do only easy movement. Do mainly relaxation. Don't push. And another advice was, don't rely on the mirror outside exercise session. It's very important to understand the mirror is good to, 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 to correct, uh, to, to send you back the image of your head posture in the space because you have lost it. And it's, uh, uh, but don't rely on it. After that, during the day, don't look in the mirror. It's like, don't rely on, the, on uh, uh, your sensory trick or your compulsory posture. That's not good for your dystonia. And of course, there is drug treatment, which uh, uh, is still anticholinergic. It's not the you see now, but it's a 3 xifenidryl And if you are under the age of 70, it could really help you if you are in the acute phase and you have no access to a botulinum toxin. You are depressed, you can see your GP or your neurologist, neurologist to discuss citalopram, which has been shown to be well tolerated in dystonia. And if you have difficulty to sleep, uh, which is also more frequent in patients with dystonia, you can uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, amitriptyline, which is also slightly anticholinergic, so will help your dystonia as well. And the key of success, again, from a rematch, but it's I totally agree with it, it's what we see with patients is perseverating in the effort, a good understanding of the natural history of your condition, and a good understanding of the treatment, and a regular life with the routine. So you can be uh, empowered and feel that you can help your dystonia. And the daily exercise has to repeat at regular time, but again, without looking for increasing duration or frequency of the exercise, don't overdo it. That's not the way that you relearn something with your brain. So in conclusion, after a storm comes a calm. So that's, and it's, and it's true for dystonia. So, so, so be confident. Don't be afraid of this prolonged interval between injections. And we know that botulinum toxin has that been a changing life uh, a treatment for uh, uh, all this, uh, all of you with focal dystonia, but don't be afraid. Stay away from ruminating thoughts. They are very toxic, and you are very vulnerable for that as a dystonic patient. Keep physically active. Very important. Don't feel scared to move. Get a daily, get a daily routine. Be kind with yourself, and think about psychomotor retraining, and contact your doctor if you need uh, uh, drugs. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Maria. That was amazing. Uh, let's just um, put the video on. Um, team, if you could un uh, 
the videos back on for us. Um, I know we have some questions from people. Uh, Dr. Marion, would you like to stop sharing your screen and then people can can see people as the videos come back on? Lovely. You're all remaining on mute, just in case you were curious about why you'll now be able to see each other but not hear each other, although I get to see you all, which is lovely. Um, we have some questions, Dr. Marion, if you don't mind, if we can if we can um, ask them. That was a really informative presentation. Um, and funnily enough, I was I was following what you were doing. I was also following the, the Facebook Live that we're doing with it and people are reacting really positively on there and saying it's a big help on there as well. So um, I don't know how to get people to clap unless I unmute you. So if you could all just clap on video without the sound, say thank you. Thank you <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, so I will, I will ask the questions which have very kindly been collated by the team. Um, so the first one, and actually this is a question, Dr. Marion, we have been asked a lot as, as a charity, is do you know if having dystonia puts you more at risk from COVID-19? It, 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 yeah, it's a very important question. The, the, the guideline for the Association of British Neurologists, which has been published and uh, recently, say in a, dystonia is in a little corner of the guidelines but they say it's only if you have a, a, a respiratory or swallowing difficulty and uh, i think that overall uh, um, dystonic patients are usually in a good health and they sh should not make them more vulnerable for the virus okay thank you that's uh, that's one as i say we have been asked quite a bit um, by lots of members. You uh, mentioned there that people with Estonia have a tendency to have depression, OCD, social phobias. Do you think that because of the dystonia or are people with these conditions more likely to develop dystonia? It's both. The, 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 the people who have done the research, the scientists have shown that uh, of course the patient have a, a react to this condition with anxiety and uh, can be depressed and can ruminate because of the dystonia is very distressing. But also we can see that all these features can be preceding the condition. And there's a lot of argument to think that it's both way, but uh, it's a true vulnerability at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, question three. My colleague Vic, if anyone wonders where I'm looking, my colleague Vic is very helpfully typing these questions out for me. Thank you, Victoria. Um, somebody has asked, is there anything people can do specifically to manage any pain they might have without the botulinum toxin treatments? It, it, it's very interesting because uh, I, I don't, I don't, I will not advise any painkiller for patients who are experiencing pain uh, 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 with their dystonia without the, the, the glutamine toxin injection. It, the pain that the patients are experiencing is not a neuropathic pain. It's not always a well-explained pain. It can be a pain because the muscles are really uh, pulling too much. And I think that in that case, all the exercise will be very helpful, the relaxation, the stretching, the moving. I mean, uh, uh, our physiotherapist colleagues say uh, uh, mo uh, motion is lotion, but certainly for pain, it's, uh, it, it's true. Okay. And if, um, oh, I was about to ask a question that disappeared as I was about to ask it. Um, so I will move on to the next question then. If there, uh, if there is a botulinum clinic still running, um, uh, or they can perhaps opt for a clinic that is still running. I hope I'm asking this question correctly. Is it still safe for people to attend? What would the recommendation be? To, to, to attend the, the abortion toxins? I'm sure that if my colleague run a abortion toxins uh, clinic now, uh, uh, they do it in the safest way. And uh, among the hospitals, they have a lot of guidelines where uh, uh, the way the patient don't wait too close in the waiting room and uh, they don't wait too long and uh, uh, they can uh, wash their hand and the doctor is protected. I think it, if it's done in a good condition, 
uh, and the doctor feels that it's safe, he will do it. He will not do it if he does not think it's safe. Um, but also you have to know that the priority in the NHS has means that all the non-urgent procedures have been stopped. And yeah. for me, we work uh, both in my NHS clinic at St. George's in ENT and in uh, uh, at my Lister HCA clinic, they have closed the outpatient uh, to, uh, to focus all the nursing staff uh, to the uh, wards. Okay. This is an interesting question. If you do continue have, having the injections, are you more prone to getting sick from the virus? No. No, of course not. No. That's a very quick and easy answer, Dr. Marion. I like those. Yeah, you, can, uh, you can be injected, <laughs> and uh, of course, if you find a, a place to be injected and uh, you feel you need it, please don't be injected. No, no, no. It's, uh, there is no, no interference with the virus at all. Uh, okay, it's um, it's because people were wondering if you were. If this is going to be interesting for me to so say, immunosuppressed. <laughs> I don't think I said that. Correctly. No, 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 no. Don't let the misunderstanding like that in uh, in the mind of patient like that. No, there is no suppressed immunity at all in dystonia, and uh, you have no multiple sclerosis treated with immunotherapy. No, you are treated. Uh, okay. You are fit and well in terms of uh, your body and yeah. uh, that reason we say you need to exercise to keep fit and well and botulinum toxin don't uh, depress your immunity at all it may even boost your immunity because it's like a vaccine so no not at all fabulous um does botulinum toxin have a shelf life and do you feel like uh there could be a lack of supply no I think there is uh, people from drug company who are listening to us, so they can uh, mention it. But even with the Brexit, I remember talking with, uh, uh, with our partner from drug company, and all of the uh, main uh, uh, Ipsen, Aragon, and Merz says that uh, they were not expecting any uh, short of supply, even when the uh, chaos of the Brexit was expected. So, uh, no, no, that, that they are prepared for that. And uh, there's no, I don't think so, but maybe they can uh, talk for also huh? in the, the, and answer the question. But I'm, I'm not expecting anything, of course not. Brilliant. If any of our actual our partners um, from any of the pharmaceutical companies can answer that question in any, any, any more uh, detail, please do pop it on the, on the chat because I have... Uh, there's about 50 videos filling up my screen and I only have some of you on screen at any one time. Um, and but then we please can, don't, we can... don't find reason to panic. You yeah. are not immunosuppressed, you're not going to be short of botulinum toxin. And as soon we can reopen the outpatient clinic and uh, reorient our nursing staff in our clinic, we will reopen and we will do more clinics every day to catch up and we will be there okay. for you. Everybody in the NHS and, uh, and people like me, we will work uh, flat out for a week or two. And uh, if we have to, to catch up, we will do it. We know that we are at home doing nothing, but we will be there. Don't worry. There's nothing to panic. That's my message, only message. Relax. Brilliant. Dr. Marion, that's so good to hear because I know that obviously stress can, can trigger for people. And so that's really helpful. Um, Oh, I'm going to say this wrong as well. You mentioned cicadi. Is, th is that what it is? Um, I was just wondering what that was. Or was it actually a question? But I don't know that I pronounced it correctly. Which one? Circadian? Yes. No. Sounds much Circadian. better when you say it. A circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is a... Uh, is, 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 is a talk about that... Uh, uh, we have an internal clock first. That's not the second reason. We have an internal clock in our brain. And uh, the example is that when we have to catch a plane, we go to bed and say, oh, I have to wake up a little bit earlier to tomorrow. It's going to be six o'clock and the taxi will pick me up. And you put your alarm on your phone and you go to bed. But magically, you wake up at six before your iPhone puts the alarm on because you have a very, very precise internal clock in your mind and if you don't take a, a, a sleeping tablet, you will wake up at the time you have said to your brain, just wake up. 
And it's the same for the toxin. We think that maybe at three months, there is a little bit your internal clock. We say, oh, I need my toxin. <gasps> because you feel you're outside the sweet spot and you, and you feel, I need my toxin, but yeah, maybe wait a little bit. And uh, uh, it's, it's maybe not, a, 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 it, it's, it's an unconscious need maybe, but not so much a physical need. And maybe you could uh, wait for four months. You don't know. Oh. And uh, until you try. And so maybe it takes this time, which is a difficult time at the moment to say, I'm going to explore my dystonia. I'm going to explore my interval. Maybe my interval is different from what I thought it was. And it's, it's, it's quite, some patients were surprised uh, last summer. We were like them and we were, oh, we did not know. And it's genuinely nobody knows. And so maybe it's the time to, 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 to try that. And maybe we should, dystonia society, maybe record the data of, of all of you patients and tell us. Uh, uh, what you need, maybe we are going to discover a lot of new things. And, but I'm not saying that the toxin is not important. Of course, it's, a, it's fantastic, it's helping, it changed life. But where are you in your dystonia at the moment? There will be, it's, it's, it's one opportunity in life to know. Perfect. Uh, right. Um... Ah, uh, interesting. Okay, so the the term we were trying to ask about was saccard, um, and somebody on the the chat has answered it very kindly for us, which is a rapid movement of the eye between fixation points. So for everyone with blepharospasm, is that that's the correct? Um, yes, yeah, the, the the movement with the eyelid of the blepharospasm. Perfect. Yes. It's just my pronunciation is very bad. Yeah. So what, what what's the question about? Uh, they, somebody just wanted to know what that term actually meant, was the question. Which term? Saccard. Am I um, set, I'm going to unmute. Yeah, there, there is ocular, motor, ocular saccade, and yes. which is uh, the movement, the, the jerk of the eyeball on one side, on the other side. But that's not the movement of the saccade we want. What we want is to move the eyelid or move the head without jerkiness. That, uh, what they understood by saccade. There is a neurological saccade, which is only for the eye movement, the eyeball movement. But in, in my talk was more the saccade that the, in the old times they were using this word to say, do it very smooth, don't try to do like that. If the dystonia makes you very saccade, saccadic like that, very jerky, right. try to be very smooth, breathe, breathe, and make it smooth. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, right, we've got a couple more questions. Um, let's make sure I'm on the right note. Uh, a lot of the information that you covered today relates to cervical or to blepharospasm, and I know we spoke about it briefly um, before everybody came on the call, but does the information apply to other focal dystonias that are also treated with botulinum toxin? Yes, they apply to all the other dystonia, but cervical dystonia and blepharospasm are the most frequent one and as an adult focal uh, onset dystonia. And, and they are the, 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 the most studied. We don't have a lot of uh, study on uh, Joe dystonia. We don't have a lot of study on, uh, uh, we have study about writer's cramp, but it's, it's, it's slightly different because it's a task specific one. And uh, uh, so it's really, but uh, Joe and what we call MESH, which is cranial, cervical dystonia patients who have blepharospasm then spread down the face and the neck. It, it's the same than for blepharospasm. Okay, brilliant, thank you. But I must um, say that patients who have the, the cranial cervical are usually quite severe. And uh, I know that these patients uh, sometimes have a certain age, they can't have the anticholinergic and they rely on the toxin. And I think right. that uh, there will be the more problematic one in this time of the, of the, of the, of the if we don't have the toxin, will be the, the patient with cranial cervical dystonia. Okay, fine. Um, brilliant. Your answers are amazing, I have to say. You also make it very relatable and very understandable. Um, what does immu... immu <laughs> I can't read today, people. I'm going to give up in a minute. The immunity. What Im, you know, Im, immobilization, immobilization. Immobilization. What's wrong with me? I know these words. What does immobilization mean? 
It's because I, 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 I mentioned them with a French accent, so I, I am not sorry. <laughs> Mine's not much better. So I'd be it's able maybe to because of me. So immobilization, when you have dystonia, dystonia is not an abnormal posture, it's an abnormal movement, and you move. Right. And if you have your head like a cervical dystonia, your head is going to move and to have a lot of what we say, saccade, jerkiness. So immobilization is that you, your head is doing that. So you put your head, you breathe, you calm down, you look at the mirror, you look at the cross of the line between the eyes and, and the middle of your face, and you try to immobilize, to stop your head moving, watching just this cross. And you just stop your head and your, your, your head stay in the midline, calm. And that's an immobilization movement exercise. And it's, it's the opposite of a movement. It's just stopping every movement. But it's hard when you got, I mean, patients who have cervical dystonia and who go for a brain MRI tell you as the nightmare it is because the radiologist say, don't move, but they're moving, of course, have a dystonia. And it's very difficult to control for a patient. And the mirror can help you because you focus on this uh, cross of the line. And uh, some patients also do, you know, they take a lamp, like the lamp to walk at night or for the cyclist, and you keep your light and you try to keep your light, which is on your head, just on a very fixed position without moving. That's an exercise of sensory feedback. A little bit like the mirror, but a more modern one. I must say I've done it a little bit old fashioned. No, it's fine. It's, they're all very useful. Um, Vic, is that next question in blue for a reason? Nope. Okay, good to know. Um, the next question is, are there any associated um, condition links? Uh, are there any associated conditions linked to other self-help presentations that you would actually recommend? We can put them up after the, after the call if there are. I'm not, sorry, can you repeat? Are there any associated conditions and links to other self-help presentations that you know of that you would recommend? Any other association of... Uh, what do you mean, link on the, on the, on the web? Hmm. Yes, um, things that people could maybe go and watch or online, maybe... Um, yes, like, we can uh, do that together, uh, Diana, and we can brilliant. discuss it. Lovely. So for the person that asked that question, we'll try and get those up on our, our website and our social media for you as soon as we can. Um, okay, so the next question is, fairly sure the answer to this, actually, I'm just going to ask the question, why am I going to assume I know it? Can private hospitals be used to carry out um, botulinum toxin injections? Yes, all the time, yes. I do my main injection in a private hospital, yes. It's the same than your NHS, but you have to pay for the toxin. Okay, so uh, although I would think at, at this time as well, I know some of the... Uh, at this time, no, it's a, yeah. the, 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 because for instance, HCA, Aspen, all these big private hospital has closed out patients to work with the NHS and they are putting all the ventilator and nurses at the disposition of the NHS. There's a big, big collaboration between NHS and private at the moment. And it really, I think it's, it, it's working well. I think, I know HCA and NHS really all the bed and the wards at the disposition to do normal surgery when the NHS do the virus, for instance. And they are covering uh, the need for the NHS at the moment. So they have closed the outpatient for that. Okay, so probably... I know for each year, I don't know all the private center in, in UK. I can't answer for mine, sorry. I, yeah. I can't answer for everybody, of course not. No, absolutely. Uh, right, so these are uh, a, a couple of questions kind of in one. Um, so will dystonia patients be regarded as low priority as um, it's not a, con a life-threatening condition and do you know if treatments for other neurological conditions are also being affected? The problem is that in dystonia the bujum toxin injection you have to do a procedure on the patient. There is a lot of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease clinic MS clinic, which are performed 
uh, uh, on Zoom, like today, on, uh, uh, by telemedicine uh, with a remote clinic. But how you can do a remote clinic and inject? That's a yeah. problem. So a lot of patients still have their neurologists available, but it's not, it's to discuss the drug treatment, to discuss symptoms, and to follow up the patient. But botulinum toxin injection, you need to inject. You have to be present with the patient and be very close to the patient. Yeah. Um, okay. So, oh, we have, well, I thought we were at the end of our questions, but it looks like we have one more. Do you know, please, if, I mean, I, we, we don't at the moment, uh, sorry, I should ask the question and then answer it. That would be a better way around to do things. Um, is it known if there are any clinics I'm going to treat in cases? As far as being told, most of them are being closed. We haven't heard from all of them. Oh, my speaker is not working apparently. Yeah, I can't hear you very well, but I understood that you say is there was a centre which are open. I don't know. I know I I see a lot of them closed because I receive a lot of email like you from patients from everywhere. Even I receive from uh, uh, other country from Europe because they are ready to come to be injected uh, privately here. Yeah, but uh, I can't I close the but like the NHS. I know that most of the NHS in London has closed, but I, I don't know. I, I, I know King's has closed, Chine Cross has closed, St. George's I think has closed. Yeah. But at least ENT St. George's we have closed. I, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. I think that maybe you could uh, it's patient who can give you the information. Right, okay. I actually think that is the end of the questions for Dr. Marion. So a huge, huge thank you for all your time. I know that um, it, has been, it has been awesome for everybody listening and really, really good. Um, can we all give Dr. Marion a very summary round of applause? The final word, be sure that as soon as the, uh, the pandemic uh, uh, stops and we can reopen and we have the green light, we will see you and all our colleague NHS private everybody is ready to to work it, it, it just we have to win yeah yeah it's, it's an interesting time we're living in. I think for, for everything and Estonia has to has to be a part of that but you, um, and you are not a low priority for neurologists oh that is That's lovely very important. I'm sure we'll make you, you are a low important. priority in terms of uh, uh, health general public yeah. health but not for neurologists, you are important. That's the reason why I hear you and me. Also, not for Dystonia UK, I have to say, you're all very, very important for us. And along with that is Dr. Marion, who has been amazing, I'm sure you will agree. Can I just say thank you to, to my team as well, to Vic and to Sylvie and to Bernie. We put this together in about, <laughs> Oh, 24, 48 odd hours, I think, from when we first spoke to Dr. Marion this week. And they have all worked like absolute troopers to make sure this all gets into your living room. So thank you very much to, to those three. Thank you very much. Uh, we will make the recording available when we can. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for joining us. If you have any feedback you would like, to please email to address uh, info at dystonia.org.uk. We are on Facebook, we are on every other social media, as I'm sure you are all aware. And now we're going to log off. So have a wonderful afternoon. Stay happy and healthy with your family and we will see you all soon. Thank you.